I uh, fully expected that we might get to um, MIDI today, but I was working through my notes and uh, remembered a few things and discovered a few things, and I think we have at least a whole additional class's worth of pattern stuff to talk about. So I'm thinking about this lecture as being like sort of intermediate advanced stuff with patterns. Uh, so I've got some uh, code here where we boot the server, and it's taken from the last two weeks, but simplified. I've removed a lot of the synth steps. And instead, we're just going to be focusing on this very simple sine wave synth step and this very simple reverb synth step. And we've given ourselves a stereo bus to work with. So we can instantiate this reverb synth in the default group and then play these events, which get translated into the creation of synths, which get added to the head of the tree. And there we go. We get some lovely reverb. The first thing I'd like to discuss is what happens when you put array values in pbind. So we will cook up a very simple pbind here. Um, actually, let's do two beats with a one second attack. One beat attack. And that should be enough information. I'm just looking for a simple textural, sort of long sinusoidal synth creating a sort of pad texture here. So. to say uh, stop here, just typing mindlessly. Didn't mean to play it a second time. OK, uh, let's make it even simpler and just say give us scale degree 0. And with default parameters, this comes out to be middle C. And I've destroyed my reverb synth, so uh, we'll just make that again, I suppose. If we wanted it even simpler, we could just say forget about the reverb for a second. You get the idea. Uh, what do you suppose happens if we um, do something like, uh, like this? So almost the exact same thing, except the, the value being supplied to the degree key of every event that this event stream player generates uh, is the array, 0, 4. In the synth def world, we're pretty accustomed to an array translating to multi-channel expansion, where mono becomes stereo, or you know, one channel becomes eight or 16 or whatever. But we have this intermediary step here. When we play a p-bind, it's an event stream player, which generates events and plays them. And when one of those keys uh, is an array, what happens is that uh, event translates into two events. Uh, so the, the, um, remembering that the default type of event is the note type of event. This is Im implied if we don't type it, because this is the default value for the type key. And a note event equates to the, the creation of a synth. So if we have an event with a key that is an array of multiple values, we get multiple notes. So this will sound uh, like this. And from here, we have some interesting options. But we need to be a little bit careful how we express it. So we started with something like this. And so the question is, how do we do this? Um, and there's a few things we might try. And I'm, I'm actually not sure which ones will work. But uh, I, I know some, some things which will work. Uh, if we do this. 
This seems like a sensible thing to try. Let's, let's use the uh, duplication shortcut and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> um, uh, let's see what happens if we uh, put these in, in curly braces. This might work. No, still doesn't work. Okay. Uh, what I think makes sense to, to do here is uh, use, a, use a pattern, actually. And there's a pattern called p-tuple, which takes, uh, like p-seq, uh, an array of things. But these things are supposed to be patterns, so we could, uh, or, or numbers. So we could do something like uh, uh, p-rand, uh, let's do the array zero dot dot two and uh, three dot dot seven. So we have the array zero one two and the array three four five six seven. Okay, so p tuple takes two things, an array of patterns and a number of times to repeat that. And what what p tuple ends up spitting out is an array of values. And the first value is determined by this pattern, and the next one is determined by this pattern. So we could actually trace this, and I'm pretty sure this will work. So p-tuple is an option. If you, uh, if you are conceiving uh, your value array as sort of each value being independently controlled by a pattern, p-tuple is a nice option. But it's not the only option. Another good option is p-func. p-func, as the name implies, takes a function. And it will evaluate that function. And whatever that function returns is what it provides to the key that that p-func is associated with. So we can say uh, the array of integers from negative seven to seven uh, dot scramble uh, at zero and one. I think this works, yeah. So we, we take this array, we mix it all up, and then we just take the first two items. So p-func is just going to return this array, which is exactly what we want. It sticks the array into degree. Um, I think there's, there's other, well, let's, we, can, we can hear this. In this case, it guarantees it won't pick the same item because it's an array of unique values. It mixes them up and takes the first two. We could also do array um, dot rand two negative seven, positive seven. This just picks two random items. They might be the same, they might not be. And p-funk is really nice. I think it's a very flexible pattern. It's, it's a good option when you can't seem to find a specific pattern that does a specific thing. You just use p-funk and express the thing you want to do as regular code. And just make sure that the last thing in the function, in this case there's just one statement, returns what you want. You can very easily say var um, thing, you know, thing equals this, thing equals thing plus whatever, whatever, whatever. You can, it's just a regular function. You can express the programming logic however is most, makes the most sense to you. And that's really all there is to say about arrays inside of p-binds. It's a great way to uh, produce um, uh, an event which results in multiple synths. You can create chords, these sort of lush textures. Um, the alter if this wasn't possible, you would have to do something a little bit awkward by making a very short duration for a few events so that it seems like they're almost simultaneous, something like that. So this, this is a very nice option. The only thing is I, I do not think you can use arrays, I, they, they will work as long as the key associated with them is an argument that is declared in the synth diff. It will always work in that case. But I think you cannot do it with dur. I think that, uh, I, I haven't tested this for sure, but I recall seeing something on the uh, listservs where someone was trying to use this uh, 
you know, expanding event feature with Dour, and also with the instrument. I, uh, I just don't think the event uh, in, uh, architecture is meant to is, expect this sort of thing. And you know, you might have like um, a, a sign and like a, another synthet which plays a buffer, and those two synthets are gonna have very different arguments. It doesn't make a lot of sense to have two of those, but then, you know, provide sets of individual arguments there. So, but it works perfectly fine for like attack, release, uh, it's very common to use it with pitch information to create chords and textures and things like that. Um, and along with, uh, let's, let's change a few of these parameters. I want to show you another feature that comes into play with a degree. Let's make this a little bit wider. And uh, can clean this up a bit. And I want the attack to be quite short, sustain to be quite short. And I added a release curve argument just to be able to shape the decay of the, uh, um, of the uh, uh, envelope. So I just, let's see what this sounds like. I'm gonna move this inside. Let's make this a uh, little bit longer. And I wanna introduce another key uh, in the same sort of family as like sustain, type, instrument, door. Some of the keys that are like inbuilt in the event structure, as opposed to these other um, keys, which are being fed into the synth. Uh, and that is strum. So strum is a value in beats by which it will separate the multiple notes that accompany this single event. The default value is zero. Oh, that was a nice one. <laughs> uh, but if we can set it to like um, a fifth of a beat and it'll sound like this. Actually, that's quite long. Let's make it really small. It's an aptly named key. It's, it's sort of like thinking about the multiple notes as strings on a guitar or a harp or something, and they're sort of strummed in this way. Um, and you can play around with it until you find a nice value. And one thing I'm noticing here is that the, the algorithm that it's using to pick degree values is ending up with uh, an unordered collection. It's just, who knows what order they're going to be in. They're just random numbers. But we can sort it if we want. So now it'll sound a little bit more like a natural strum with strings being tuned from low to high. So strum is a very charming little key that you can use for certain effects. It's, you can imagine it would be clumsy to try to do this without strum. You would have to do some complicated thing with doer, which would be just kind of obnoxious. Here we can just specify the where the collection lands, and then Strum will take care of scheduling them. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. All right, so let's move on to uh, rest events. Rest events are important, uh, and they're very useful. Most of the time, 99% of the time, when we're working with PBind, we're making synths, and so we're using note events. But rests are an important part of musical expression. Um, you know, when where there is sound, there's also silence. And in no notated music, we actually explicitly say, do a rest here, rest here, rest here. Um, and so it's often very convenient to be able to express some musical sequence uh, as a series of notes and rests, rather than like awkwardly zeroing the amplitude or waiting a certain amount of time. Uh, Doer should not be thought of as a, you know, a, uh, if you say, you know, Two, it does not mean play a 16th note and wait for, you know, 15, rest for six, 15, 16th notes. That's not really what it means. Dur only handles the onset timing of events. It doesn't know anything about rests. So how do we do rests? Um, the primary way we do that is using the rest class. There's a, this is a fairly new addition to Super Collider. There were some other options, and there remain other deprecated options in Super Collider for expressing rests, but the the recommended way is to use the rest class. And I will copy this pattern, make a new one, and we'll stick some rests into, uh, into this pattern.
Okay, basic pattern here. We're keeping it musically very simple today. And uh, we're playing this on the default tempo clock, which is 60 beats per minute. And an eighth of a beat is uh, you know, an eighth of a quarter note at 60. So if the, uh, you think of the one quarter note as being you know, a one second, then this is an eighth of a second. So it's a you know, half, 16, 30 second note at uh, 60 beats per minute, I think. Half quarter eighth, yeah. and uh, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> we can just think of it as an eighth of a second for now. All right. So uh, to um, the the rule is, if any key in an event uh, has a value which is a rest object, that event becomes a rest type event. And a rest event, if I didn't say this already is a very simple type of event. It does nothing. It's a, it has a duration value, and that's it. It just sort of does nothing for us, and then you know, door beats later, it goes on to the next event, whatever it happens to be. So we could do something like this, a p rand. Uh, we'll say p seek. Uh, rest. And in this case, we need to, uh, we, we don't need to provide anything for the rest object. Uh, well, essentially, what happens here is we play the p bind, and degree uh, you know, is controlled by a p rand, which is either going to pick a random value or pick this one rest object. Uh, and the, the door value here is always 0.125. So we, we already know how long the rest is supposed to be. Uh, so 50% of the time, we'll, we'll get a rest. And we could even, um, I think we could, uh, we can trace this, and we should, uh, we can then sort of stop and rewind and, and look at the post window. And uh, we, it's not showing us the type, but it is showing us that um, the uh, the rest object is populating the degree. Uh, key, and we, we get the we get the results we want. We could do something like this and sort of slant our decision making process towards notes or rests if we wanted. So something like this: uh, eighty percent of the time we get a note, and twenty percent of the time we get a rest. And you'll notice that the, uh, the release of the envelope is completely ignorant and independent of the rest. Rest does not mean silence. It means no event, you know, um, no note is generated, no nothing is generated. It's just waiting and then moving on. So if these release times were, you know, really long, we won't actually get any silence. But we can hear in the pattern of articulations that some, you know, sometimes we don't get a note. And you can stick this into any pattern. It doesn't have to be degree. Uh, uh, it can be sort of anything. And, uh, and it will, that event will become a rest event. Another way to do this, um, I mean, it's pretty much the same, same concept, but we can uh, build, build the rests into the door pattern. And when we do here, we actually have to tell each rest how long it's supposed to be. So we can say p rand. Uh, we'll say... Um, hmm. We're picking uh, from four things here. A door value of one eighth, a door value of a quarter, a rest of an eighth, and a rest of a quarter. So we get a nice sort of mix here. I think if we don't provide a value, uh, as we saw up here, the default rest value is one beat. So you, you know, you're not obligated to provide something here, but if you don't, it, it's going to get translated to one beat. 
And the, the last way, which I think is kind of cute, and I, I, don't, I really like this, and I, I tend to use this in my work, and I, it works perfectly fine. Um, if you read through the REST help file, I think it sort of suggests that for various reasons, maybe this is not the most optimal way. I don't really care. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't, bother, doesn't bother me. But the, the way that works is um, any of the frequency streams, degree, note, MIDI note, and freak, if one of those values is a symbol, doesn't matter what symbol, a symbol being something like this, right, one of these green things, uh, then the event with which that symbol is associated becomes a rest event. So this looks like this. Uh, and I like to use the empty symbol because it's short and it's, the, it's literally the shortest symbol possible. Um, and this is, this is in fact a symbol, right? Nothing wrong with that. But you could also say rest if you really wanted to. Any symbol, doesn't matter. That looks fine. Uh, so this will sound like this. Uh, what did I do wrong? I forgot a comma right here. And the reason I like this is because it starts to look very traditional notation-y. You can actually sort of see the rhythm and the notes in the syntax. And I find this very appealing. The fact that the rest class is capital R-E-S-T parentheses and you know, it, it makes it a little bit more uh, work to kind of make everything visually look nice. Uh, but a little, a little trick here. I mean, you, you can still do it. Normally when we hit tab, it just tries to auto indent, but shift tab works like actual tabs. And this is something that took me a long, an embarrassingly long time to realize. But you can, you can put tabs in your work, which helps you line stuff up in nice ways. This is just a white space management thing. But anyway, so that's the rest event. Um, if you find yourself zeroing amplitudes or doing something awkward with durations to, in order to get some particular rhythm, um, stop and, and remember that there's the rest event and that, that will, uh, it's really good to use the rest event in the long run. It's a very handy class. It's a great way of explicitly telling Super Collider, do nothing here, as opposed to making it like think it's doing a long note or something. So it's very handy. Okay, this next thing I wanna talk about in the pattern world is something that I see come up a lot on the listserv and people have this, this kind of question naturally arises and it is how to express one key value in terms of another. For example, if you, as the pitch gets higher, you might want the amplitude to be lower, uh, you know, for higher pitches. There's a couple of ways to do this. And what I'm going to do is uh, change a few things again. I guess we didn't need strum at all up here. That was totally not relevant. I'm just gonna delete that. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, and let's, instead of degree, let's do MIDI note. And I'm actually going to do PLP Rand. If we haven't seen this already, this is the, it's a min-max pattern, but the way PLP Rand is, uh, it chooses two values and picks the lower one. So it's a way of slightly favoring lower values, as opposed to P white, which just picks one value and that's the one it uses. So, uh, all right, uh, let's um, play this. If we if we increase this, some of the some of the high ones, just because of our natural sensation of loudness, it's they really pop out. And so something we, we might want to do is have the uh, amplitude depend on the um, the MIDI note number. And the first thing we want to do is make sure that the dependent key appears after the independent key. So we need to somehow access the MIDI note value. And there are two ways to do this, two, two very easy ways to do it. 
One is using a pattern called P key. And P key just takes one thing, the key of some other pattern in the P bind. So if we stopped here and ran this, it would be terrible because it's going to be using amplitude values between 40 and 110. Uh, so we're not done, but this is the first step. We access the value here. And so I think what makes sense is to actually do uh, decibels and say uh, lin lin 40, 110 to, I mean, the low ones should be the loudest. So we'll put those at something like uh, minus 12 and the high ones all the way down to like minus 40. So we're just taking the range that goes from 40 to 110 and remapping it so that the minimum translates to negative 12 and the maximum translates to negative 40 and it's linear interpolation all the way along. And uh, I think that's even a little bit too loud for me. So I'm gonna go down here and we will trace both of these just to see what's going on here. Okay, so here we had a note 42, and that comes out to minus 16, minus 17 decibels. Note 94, quite high, that gets reduced quite a bit, minus 42. Um, very handy little trick. And um, it's, it's also taking advantage of the fact that patterns respond to mathematical operations. Just like the, if the pattern outputs a number, you can apply some sort of numerical method, like square root or whatever, right? Uh, so it doesn't really matter. So this simply re represents the MIDI node value. And then we do what we need to do to make it a suitable value for this key. And I, I do believe these have to be in the right order. Um, what happens if they're in the wrong order is uh, DB gets calculated first and it uses the default MIDI note value, which is, uh, I think, a 60, MIDI, uh, uh, middle C. Uh, and so it's going to turn that into some DB value, plug it into the event, and then it's gonna actually overwrite that MIDI note function with one of these values. So I believe in this case, uh, we will always get whatever 60 translates to, you know, minus 25 or 23 or whatever. Um, so it, it's important that they are in the right order. That's one option. The other option is something we've already seen, pfunk. Right? But, uh, Again, this is, if we just stop here, it kind of begs the question, okay, how do we access, how does this help us, right? How do we, we still need to access PLP RAND, and the implication is here, this is an alternative to P key. We can't use P key here, but we can declare an argument inside of this P func. We've seen this plenty of times. We declare arguments inside of a synth def to create control parameter values. We declare an argument inside of a do or a collect in order to pull the values in from the collection on which it's operating. In this case, inside of a pfunc, inside of a pbind, the argument we declare represents the event that is currently being built. So all we have to do is say ev add midi node. And there we go, we've accessed the midi node key at the event. So, you know, on this, as, as this pbind is playing, as, as this event stream player is scheduling events, it says, okay, let's make the next event. Its instrument is sign, its duration is 0.25, its attack is this, its MIDI note is whatever. Its decibel value is, okay, well, let's l see what we have in the event already. Oh, we already did MIDI note. It's, it happened to be, you know, 72 or whatever. So we can do the same thing here. Uh, nope, 40, 110, minus 16, minus 50. And again, pfunc just takes this expression, whatever the function returns, and slots it in to the db key. And there we go. Very, very convenient. This comes up quite often when working with uh, pbinds and synth thefts that play buffers. For example, if you have an array of buffers, and they're all different lengths, right? Uh, and they all they have they have different numbers of frames, different start positions, things like that. Uh, Pfunk is really helpful here because you you at the top you'll say buff b at 12, right? The buffer at index 12, and then you want to do stuff like uh, determine where to start, determine how long to play. You just use Pfunk. You pass in the event and you say ev at buff, 
dot duration dot whatever. And so you can access information about the buffer that was already selected for that event. And that avoids all sorts of things like telling a buffer to start, telling a play buff to start playing at an out of bounds frame index or something like that. Um, so yeah, whenever, whenever you sort of need to access information from other keys, P key usually works. P funk is, I, I think this is my preferred option. I just love being able to express whatever I need to express in this function. Just write it out, write it out myself. Yeah. All right. We talked uh, on uh, last week about tempo clock a little bit, but we didn't talk about quantization. Is that correct? Pretty sure we did not touch on quantization. So I think we all know what we're talking about when we talk about quantization, but just in case we don't, it's, it's uh, time quantization, being able to cause uh, event stream players to begin on a very specific beat. And this, of course, helps us synchronize multiple patterns. Because right now we're just playing them on the default tempo clock, but they don't naturally go on the next beat. They just kind of happen immediately. And so if we try to synchronize two patterns without quantizing, it's just kind of a mess. So we'll start with um, a simple pattern. And uh, go back to degree and call this amp. Okay, first things first, let's actually make a tempo clock. Uh, 112 beats per minute. Uh, and just so we don't have to uh, make it again and again, if we hit command period, we'll make it permanent. And before we get into quantizing this pattern, uh, I want to, uh, one thing that's initially kind of frustrating about tempo clocks is that they're invisible. We have to sort of trust that they're running. And we'd, we'd kind of like to be able to know, where are you? What's your current beat? When's the next downbeat? And things like that. Uh, so sometimes it's useful to actually manually schedule something to happen on the tempo clock, like it printing its beat information. So I'm going to make a function called postinfo. And when we evaluate this function, it's going to say t.beats.postln. So if we evaluate this function now, like this, it evaluates itself and it says the current beat value on tempo clock t is this. And tempo clock is just counting and counting and counting. <laughs> this is a step in the right direction, but we can do better. Uh, and we can actually say schedule on tempo clock t at an absolute uh, beat value, um, you know, whatever it happens to be. Um, uh, we could say, you know, like 200 and try to guess when, you know, I don't, what beat are we currently at? 138. We still have some time. <laughs> so we'll try to live code it here. And we'll say um, post info at, uh, yeah, just uh, the function. We're going to schedule at beat 200, this function. And I'm going to adjust this, actually, uh, 170. We'll say 180. So yeah, there, that's 180. So it, it basically, we, we said the tempo clock, hey, when, one, when beat 180 comes, run this function. And it does. And that's fine. Uh, and um, there's actually a little bit of a trick here. The, um, the value that this function returns, whatever, the, and it returned a value of 180, is interpreted as a reschedule time. So 180 beats later, it'll run this function again, again, and again. Not really what we wanted. Uh, so if we say, um, you know, nil here, then the function returns nil and it's not rescheduled. If we do one, then this function will be rescheduled every beat. And also, uh, this is stupid. We shouldn't be, have to guess, you know, when the next beat is. This is annoying. We can just say t dot next bar. This always gives us the next downbeat that's coming. So it's, you can, we can tell that we're somewhere between 248 and 288, sorry, 284, 288. And so this is just telling us the next downbeat. By default, tempo clocks uh, group their beats in groups of four. So every bar is four beats. You can change all this. It's all very customizable. 
But uh, now, if we uh, reevaluate this function so that it returns 1 and schedule it on the next bar, then it will uh, give us, start, start posting the number of beats starting on the next downbeat, and it'll just count beats. So this is kind of nice. And in fact, you can, you can improve this even a little bit more by uh, you know, making it a little bit more readable, saying uh, mod 4. And this will just uh, divide by 4 and take the remainder. And this actually gives us like a, a beat counter. So anything which is divisible by 4, mod 4, is 0. Anything divisible by 4 plus 1 gives us 1. So it just, it's counting 0, 1, 2, 3. You could even just add 1 if you want to make it look extra human readable, and like it's counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, like an actual conductor. Uh, that's a matter of taste. I think I prefer the zeros because I mean, it's time 0, right? Anyway, and we can, we can uh, undo this at any time by changing the definition of the function to be empty. And this means next time it gets scheduled, it returns nothing. And so it disappears, and nothing's being posted again. Uh, and if we wanted to bring it back, we can clump these two lines together and just run this whenever we want to. And it starts telling us where we are. So we might, we might just leave this, because this will be useful in seeing how quantization works. So let's get back to our pattern here. There's our p-bind. And when we play a pattern, there's technically three things we can provide to the play message. One is the clock. So we definitely want to play it on this clock, because we created it. It's running at 112 beats per minute. Perfect. The next thing is a, a proto event, which is like the, the starting event to give to the pattern, which it will then fill. I think the default thing is the empty event. So we can just provide the empty event or just skip right over it by saying quant, which is the third thing we get to provide. And uh, this. The quant value, uh, if we provide a single number, it will be interpreted as a, uh, the next beat multiple. So if we provide a 1, it's going to quantize to the next beat. If we provide a 2, it's going to quantize to the next beat value, which is a multiple of 2. Uh, or qu quant 4, it's going to be the next downbeat, basically, the, next, the beginning of the next bar. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a simplification because if, uh, if you, for example, if you change the number of beats per bar mid piece to be three instead of four, then the count, it, it has no problem counting beats. But then if you change it back to four beats per minute, the downbeat might not be a multiple of four anymore. But quant knows how to deal with this. So the best way to think of it is just sort of like the, as a metrical value, like the nearest whole note, the nearest half note, the nearest quarter note. Um, so, so let's do the nearest, let, let's quantize it to the nearest downbeat. So this will begin playing uh, when we see a, a zero. I meant to highlight the zero. When we see a zero. So it should, should work. Here we go. Yeah. It's a, and there's a little bit of a desynchronization between the posting to the post window and what we hear. But that's, don't be distracted by that. It's, internally, it is right on the downbeat. Right. Um, OK, so I can slow this down a little bit, actually, just to really hear it. So we can just run it whenever we like. And comes right in. And that means we can start to do things like uh, locking other patterns to the same clock, as long as they have an appropriately similar quantization value. We'll just uh, add 4 here. And we'll go ahead and quantize it to the nearest, uh, you know, the nearest uh, double bar, right? So let's see. OK, that was it. So then 6, 7, 8, 1. I did a, a silly thing, and I gave these the same name, which was a mistake. I should be calling them something like this. You know, do it again. And my, uh, my things are gone. Give me the metronome again.
Temple clock is a very, very nice object, very powerful. It's got lots of features. Um, you can schedule tempo changes. You can schedule meter changes. It's all very nice. Um, I guess it takes a little bit of getting used to, but um, let's keep moving here. Um, okay, this is a really important one, and I, I think I might not get to everything. We'll, we'll try to cram it all in, but uh, w one thing that's consistent across all these examples is that uh, if we want to make a change to the pattern, we can't really do it in an, in an easy way. Um, for example, um, if I want to uh, change the pitch information, you know, like I want to, I want to change this pattern. Like I want to add more things here. It doesn't doesn't do anything. Right? I mean, if I if I uh, play it now. Uh, you know, it works, but you know, we don't want two of these. We want to change the one that's currently playing. And with this kind of paradigm, it's not possible, actually. It's, it's, uh, you would have to do something like um, timing the stopping of this one and the starting of another one, and that's just very clumsy. And this is where pattern proxy objects come into play. And this is actually, we're beginning to scratch the surface on a very large library of classes called proxies and uh, various proxy adjacent classes, which are highly optimized for live coding, being able to make sound with code and actually change and compose and manipulate the sound by editing the code as it's happening and reevaluating and reevaluating. And it's a wonderful, a fluid, liberating experience if you sort of are into that sort of thing and, and want to practice it. So, how do we do it? I will start um, with the, uh, the sort of easy way to do it, and that is uh, p def n. We, we wrap uh, the parameter we want to be able to change inside a p def n object. p def n is a proxy for value patterns. And when I say proxy, I mean uh, it, it's usually described as a placeholder, something which keeps a reference to something which may or may not exist and which might change. And it's just this, by this wrapping method allows us to redefine the contents by reevaluating the PDFN. So I, this name here is not, this is just something I conjured up on the spot. It has to be unique, like names of synth defs have to be unique, otherwise one overwrites the other. So I'm just, you know, the name of the synth def underscore and the thing we want to control. So this is all fine, nothing, nothing unusual going on here. So then to change this, we just run it again. Uh, let's take away that last scale degree. Uh, what did I do? I forgot a, one of these. Yeah. Oh, that's not what I want. Yeah, and so if you listen carefully, when I run this, let's let's do uh, let's do one of these. Right, so it's going to pick a random transposition value. And what I'm trying to demonstrate here. Is that it? It's not really uh, sequence aware. When we when we uh, reevaluate this PDFN, because we haven't specified otherwise, the change kind of kicks in right away, and so it doesn't really matter where we are in this sequence. Uh, it it just sort of just replaces the old one with the new one and keeps going. Right? You can quantize PDFNs, uh, but you have to do so in a in a kind of smart way. Like if you um, you know, if, if you're quantizing to the nearest downbeat and this degree sequence uh, in combination with the door values provide a, a sequence which exists within the frame of one bar, then everything makes sense. But if you have a, a sequence which is like 1.3 bars and you start switching around and, and changing the length of the sequence and then but continue telling it to quantize to the nearest bar, then you're going to create hiccups in your sequence. So you have to, you know, be mindful about this and compose in such a way that your 
sequential logic is um, internally consistent. Um, so let's uh, do another example here. So we'll do. Uh, And you know what we got to do? We got to quantize this to the nearest beat here. So take a second. And then we will copy this here. And uh, we'll just subtract two from every value. And I think what we need to do here is we can do it this way. Set its quant value. Uh, we can also do do something like this. Different syntax, same thing. All right, we're saying this p to fn, your quant value is four. So if we do this, it comes in right at the right time. Defense can be quantized, uh, and this is a good this is a good option, particularly if there's if you know in advance you don't want to mess with any other parameter except degree. And, and that's the case, then go ahead and use pdefn and wrap it around the pattern controlling degree. But if you suddenly mid performance want to change the release curve or the door values or something, well, you're kind of out of luck. So a better option is to use uh, a class called pdef. So pdef is like pdefn in that it wraps around some thing and serves as a placeholder for that thing. So that thing can be changed at leisure. But instead of representing a value pattern, pdef uh, is used for an event pattern like pbind. So you can't use pdefn here. It's because, because the thing it's serving as a proxy for is an event pattern like pbind, uh, we need to use pdef. And it's kind of like synth def, where we provide a symbol for its name, and then the thing, the actual meat and potatoes of, of that. So uh, we do this. Uh, we quantize it. And then we play it on a clock. <laughs> Now, uh, any parameter inside this pbind is up for grabs. So we'll just make it quieter. So it just instantly becomes quieter. Uh, we'll change, forget about pc, let's do uh, p white. And we'll also make everything twice as fast. Uh, and we'll say dot round two. So now it's only taking scale degrees that are even numbers, right? Every other note in the scale. And at any time, you can you know, change the quant value to be something else or nil, which means don't quantize anymore. Just kick these changes in immediately. Uh, keep in mind that if you are working with a pattern which is unquantized and then suddenly you decide you want to quantize it, there, there might be a hiccup when you make a change because suddenly it has to lock itself to the nearest beat. So uh, it's generally good to plan in advance. Is this a pattern I, I'm going to want to quantize at some point? If so, just go ahead and quantize it up front. Uh, let's see, we can swap this out for a MIDI note. Sort of detuned itself in a in a way I wasn't expecting. Let's see. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> this is longer.
So it's a very fluid experience, uh, PDF and, and PDFN. It just opens up brand new possibilities of, of being able to make decisions while it's playing instead of having to plan in advance and then you know, set up all your dominoes and knock them over. This way you can intercept your dominoes and change their directions and stuff like that. Um, there, is, there is one last pattern I want to introduce. I know we're a little bit over time, but this one is, it's, a, uh, it's called PSEG. And uh, I'm gonna play this again. And uh, actually, I'll talk about it first. Um, so PSEG is, is basically a pattern which is the em envelope equivalent of, uh, the, the equ pattern equivalent of env.new. And so it's a, it's a pattern which is expressed in time uh, independent of the number of events that are generated. So if you're generating 1,000 events a second or one event per second, doesn't matter. The timing of PSEG is, is um, consistent. And PSEG takes three things, a pattern which outputs um, levels, like this, uh, a pattern which outputs durations, like this, and a pattern that outputs curves, like this. So the first value from this, which is one, is used as the starting point. And then the second value is the target, the first sort of the second breakpoint in the envelope. This is the duration and this is the curve. So it's just like env.new. And I think this is quite a lot to type. It'll work just fine if you plug it in. Like for, for example, uh, let's, let's actually do this. And, uh, and I'm gonna change a few things. So what I can do is I can grab this PSEG and then just like paste it in here and scale the amplitude by it. So now whatever these values are, they're going to get scaled from 1 to 0 over 10 seconds. And it's a nice way of fading out a pattern, basically, because we've been kind of stopping them, doing hard stops. There's a shortcut to this. It's a... Uh, uh, which I discovered pretty recently. And you can, it's the as pseg method. So you can say env.new, one, zero, 10, uh, negative three, just like a normal envelope as pseg. This is re I love this. And you can, because if you're so used to envelopes and just expressing things like this, it gets converted to the appropriate pseg, which will generate this envelope. less typing and I think it also looks a little nicer. I feel like PSEG is just usually a lot of patterns inside of a pattern. It's a little messy. All right. Uh, so I, um, I guess that's it. I, uh, I know there's been a lot of homework problems on patterns recently, so I think we'll take a week off in terms of homework assignments. Uh, although I invite you to um, explore these, these pattern techniques and, and kind of start composing with them because these are just some intermediate things here, and um, but it's it's a lot of good ingredients for high-level pattern expression and score language for making music in Super Collider. So uh, that's it. Um, enjoy the week, and I think we're going to talk about MIDI next week. So see you then. <laughs>